your plain old telephone and the pair of copper wires connecting it to your local exchange constitute one small element of a global telecommunications network of astonishing scope and complexity. The Public Switch Telephone Network, or PSTN, is a vast array of conventional phone lines, fiber optic cables, microwave links, communication satellites, and undersea cables interconnected at exchanges using standardized communications protocols and fully integrated with cellular networks and the internet. Thanks to this vast network and the international standards that ensure consistent transmission of information across it, your phone can connect with any other telephone in the world in a matter of seconds. In today's lecture, we'll begin by looking at how the PSTN operates as a communications network, in contrast with other types of networks like the internet. We'll then examine the key transmission media and technologies that constitute the PSTN, and we'll see how the ongoing digital communications revolution is changing this system even as we speak. Now, there are two basic types of telecommunications networks, circuit-switched and packet-switched. In a circuit-switched network, information is transmitted through a dedicated communications channel from one terminal through one or more intermediate nodes to another end station. The connection must be fully established end-to-end -end before the transmission can begin, and then it's released after the transmission is complete. Circuit switch communications are characterized as continuous, exclusive, and temporary. Continuous because once the con connection is established, it's maintained for the duration of the call. Exclusive because the channel isn't shared with any other users during the transmission. And temporary because the connection only exists for the duration of the call. The quintessential example of a circuit switched network is the public switch telephone network. In the PSTN, the terminals are usually telephones and the nodes are switches located at the local tandem and toll exchanges. As we learned in our last lecture, the switch was once a human plugging wires into a switchboard manually. But today the term switch refers to a specialized computer that's used to establish connections between transmission lines. A fundamental characteristic of the PSTN is that the switches are smart so that your telephone doesn't have to be. When you dial a phone number, it's the switches that figure out the optimum path through the network to your recipient, taking into account the current level of traffic and working around any trunks or switches that are currently out of service. It's the switches that generate dial tones, ring tones, call waiting and busy signals. And it's the switches that establish and later release your connection. All this so you can use a simple telephone with no processing power of its own. The pr principal advantage of the PSTN's circuit-switched architecture is quality of service. Once the connection is established, there's minimal latency or delay, so the system is optimal for real-time voice traffic. The disadvantage is relative inefficiency resulting from the fact that most phone conversations actually consist of approximately 50% silence when we pause to gather our thoughts, take a breath, or wait for the other party to respond. As such, that dedicated communication channel is usually operating far below its capacity. This limitation is ingeniously addressed in the packet switched network, a fundamentally different network architecture that's the basis for the internet. In a packet switch network, a transmission, which might be voice or data, is broken up into many small chunks called packets, which are then transmitted independently across a shared network with each packet potentially following a different route. At the network nodes are devices called routers, which receive packets and forward them onward through the network. Each packet incorporates a header containing two key pieces of information, the address of the packet's destination and a sequence number, which is ultimately used to reassemble the packets in the correct order at their destination. At each node, the router processes packets independently on a first in, first out basis, determining only the next node in each packet's journey. 
This determination is based on a routing protocol that typically attempts to minimize the number of nodes along the remainder of the path. All transmission lines in a packet switch network are shared, so packets originating from many different sources are constantly arriving in the queues of the routers. During periods of heavy traffic, these queues can cause considerable latency or delay. And if any queue exceeds the storage capacity of its associated router, the overflow packets are simply lost. That's why sometimes that web page never finishes loading. The major advantage of packet switching is that it's highly efficient use of network resources. In comparison with a circuit switched model, packet switching also represents a decentralization of intelligence from the core of the network to its outer periphery. Internet routers don't need to be as smart as PSTN switches because processors at the source and the destination do most of the heavy lifting, creating and addressing the packets and then reassembling them after transmission. This characteristic, decentralized intelligence, enhances the system's redundancy and resilience while also enabling the internet's most characteristic feature, its capacity to grow and change in creative new ways, seemingly on a daily basis without any centralized control. The disadvantages of packet switching, latency and data loss, reflect the fact that the internet was originally designed for the efficient transmission of so-called bursty data. That is, data sent in short spurts, separated by long periods of inactivity. Email is a perfect example of bursty data. While you're reading a message, thinking about it, and composing a response, no data are being transmitted. Then you hit send and launch all those packets within a fraction of a second. Packet switching is ideally suited for this sort of communication. Today, however, we're demanding much more from the internet. Streaming video, voice over IP telephone service, interactive online gaming, communications that are anything but bursty. And the internet is changing to accommodate these demands. But it's changing in ways that are far beyond the scope of this particular course. The PSTN, on the other hand, was designed and optimized for transmission of the human voice. So before we examine the technologies underlying the PSTN, we should talk a bit about the human voice and its representation in both analog and digital communications. This is my voice, displayed in real time as an analog waveform. Now what you're really seeing here is a graph of volume versus time. And as we zoom in on that graph, we see that it's actually a series of irregular waves which makes sense, since we know that sound propagates in waves. We also know from our discussion of alternating current in an earlier lecture that all wave phenomena can be characterized by a few key parameters. The maximum height of the wave is its amplitude. And for a sound wave, the amplitude corresponds to volume. A larger amplitude corresponds to a louder sound. The time required for one full cycle is called the period and one divided by the period equals the frequency, expressed in cycles per second or hertz. For a sound wave, the frequency corresponds to the pitch. Low frequency, high frequency. Now, how do these parameters apply to my voice? Well, here the waveforms are quite irregular, but we can still discern sinusoidal cycles. Here, for example, this wave has a period of 0.0002 seconds. Thus, the frequency is 1 divided by 0 0.0002 equals 5,000 hertz, which is a very high D sharp. But this snippet of my voice is actually dominated by a larger waveform, 10 times longer, with a frequency of about 500 hertz. That's the B above middle C. As you can see, our voices are actually a mix of waveforms with varying frequencies. Indeed, the human voice can generate frequencies from about 100 to 10,000 hertz. Now, anytime we express a range of frequencies in this way, we're defining a bandwidth. Thus, the bandwidth of the human voice is approximately 10,000 minus 100 equals 9,900 hertz. However, most of the sounds that constitute intelligible speech fall within a much narrower range, 
from about 250 to 3400 hertz. And so communications channels that are intended for transmission of the human voice are typically allocated a bandwidth of 4000 hertz. Voice transmissions can take either of two forms, analog or digital. In the modern PSTN, most voice signals start out as analog in the local loop, are converted to digital for transmission through the core, and then are converted back to analog for the last mile to the recipient. We've already seen analog transmission in our discussion of plain old telephone service in the last lecture. When pressure waves propagating from my vocal cords encounter the microphone in my telephone, these continuous variations in volume are converted into similar variations in both electrical current and voltage, which then propagate through the subscriber line to my local exchange. Digital transmission is a bit more complicated because it requires that we represent this irregular continuous waveform as a series of ones and zeros. To accomplish this, we're going to sample the waveform at regular intervals of time. And because the bandwidth of the voice transmission will be 4000 hertz, we'll sample at twice that rate, 8000 samples per second, to ensure that we adequately capture the variations in amplitude and frequency. At each of these points, we measure the voltage of the voice signal and represent it as an 8-bit number. Okay, so what's a bit? A bit is the basic unit of information in digital communications and computing. It can have only two possible values, 1 or 0. And so for our 8-bit number, each digit can be either 1 or 0. Two possible values for each digit means that the total number of possibilities is 2 times 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 2, or 2 to the 8th power, or 256. And each of these numbers corresponds to a level of voltage in the voice signal. Thus, my digitized voice is actually a series of 8-bit numbers, each representing the volume of my voice at an instant in time, measured and sent down the line 8,000 times every second. The resulting rate of data transfer, called the bit rate, is 8 bits per sample times 8,000 samples per second equals 64,000 bits per second. Now what we've just done is to define the standard voice channel used in the PSTN, a bandwidth of 4,000 hertz and a bit rate of 64,000 bits per second. This specification, which is known as DS0 in telecommunications lingo, is a very powerful metric for understanding and comparing the capabilities of transmission media used in the PSTN. The transmission medium that was once used throughout the PSTN is this pair of twisted copper wires. Today, most of the copper in the core of the network has been replaced by transmission media with far greater capacity. But as we've seen, the twisted pair is still used extensively in the local loop of the plain old telephone service. And this is hardly surprising, since copper wires are both less expensive and easier to work with than all of the alternatives. Copper cable has a usable bandwidth of about 1 million hertz and can move data at a bit rate of 2 to 3 million bits per second. But impressive as these numbers might sound, they pale in comparison with other transmission media. And beyond their limited capacity, copper wires suffer from severe signal attenuation, which causes the signal to get weaker over a very short distance, and high susceptibility to noise and interference, which introduce errors into the data stream. In the local loop of the PSTN, these limitations are addressed simply by locating local exchanges or concentrators within about two miles of the subscribers that they serve. But in a long distance trunk, the only way to compensate for signal attenuation is to place amplifiers at approximately one mile intervals along its length. Now an amplifier uses externally supplied energy to boost the power of an input signal and then it sends the amplified output signal on down the line. The amplifier was invented in 1906, and its first practical application was to facilitate long-distance telephone transmission. These early amplifiers used vacuum tube technology, 
which remained in vogue until the transistor was invented in 1947. Interestingly, vacuum tube amplifiers are still used in certain specialized applications, like satellites, as we'll learn in our lecture on satellite communications. And because amplifiers work in only one direction, the core of the PSTN was developed with four-wire circuits, rather than the two-wire configuration of your local loop. When we have a conversation over a four-wire circuit, my half of the conversation travels in one pair of wires, and your half goes the other direction in the other pair. Recognize, however, that in modern inter-exchange voice transmissions, you'll never actually have one set of wires all to yourself. Various types of multiplexing are used to squeeze many simultaneous calls into one circuit. The original type, called frequency division multiplexing, was actually invented before the telephone for use in uh, telegraph systems in the late 19th century. And because it's best suited for analog transmission, this was the principal form of multiplexing used in the PSTN until the system's digital transition in the mid 20th century. In frequency division multiplexing, the total bandwidth available for transmission is subdivided into a series of non-overlapping frequency sub-bands, each of which constitutes a separate communications channel. For each of these bands, an electronic oscillator is used to create a carrier signal with its frequency at the center of the band. This carrier frequency is always significantly higher than the frequency of the voice signals that are being transmitted. Within each band, the carrier and voice signals are then electronically mixed through a process called modulation. There are several different types, but the most common are amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. In amplitude modulation, the amplitude of the carrier signal is modified to match the amplitude of the voice signal, like this. In frequency modulation, the frequency of the carrier wave is modified to represent the voice signal. In both cases, the effect is to piggyback the voice signal onto the carrier signal for each channel. All channels are then transmitted simultaneously through a single circuit and sorted out at the destination by sending the combined signal through a bank of receivers, each tuned to a different frequency. The individual channels must be demodulated by subtracting the carrier signal from the modulated signal to reconstruct the original voice signal. And by the way, just in case you haven't figured it out yet, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation are also used for AM and FM radio transmission. Indeed, the familiar concept of broadcast radio can really help us understand the somewhat less familiar concept of multiplexing. In radio, the electromagnetic magnetic signals transmitted by many different radio stations are all simultaneously impinging upon your radio's antenna. But by tuning your receiver to the frequency of one specific transmitter, you can isolate that particular signal from all the others. Broadcast and cable television work essentially the same way. Now for telephone, only 24 conversations at most can be multiplexed onto a standard four-wire copper circuit. Beyond that, the higher frequencies required for multiplexing cause excessive power loss. This limitation was overcome with the development of coaxial cable. Now you'll recognize this stuff as the cable used for cable TV, but it was actually developed in the 1920s as a replacement for twisted pairs in the inter-exchange trunks of the PSTN. Coaxial cable, or coax, consists of a heavy copper core surrounded by an insulating plastic sheath woven metal shield, and an outer protective jacket. In a circuit, the copper core serves as the conductor and the woven shield as the return path. The great advantage of this arrangement is that the electromagnetic field generated by the conductor is largely confined within the shield, resulting in less power loss and greater resistance to interference. Standard coax also can support a bandwidth of 370 megahertz. That's 370 times more than a twisted pair. And when used with frequency division multiplexing, a pair of cables can carry 13,200 of those standard DS0 voice signals simultaneously. 
Still, the use of coax is severely constrained by the need for amplifiers, spaced at roughly one and a half mile intervals along the transmission lines. This limitation led to a new technology, microwave communications, developed originally for military applications during World War II, and subsequently deployed into the core of the PSTN as a replacement for coax on long distance trunks. A microwave is a form of electromagnetic radiation, a very high frequency radio wave, which can be focused into a narrow beam and used for point to point communication. We'll discuss the electromagnetic spectrum in greater detail in the next lecture when we examine cellular technology. For now, suffice it to say that microwaves provided a substantial improvement over coax in terms of both capacity and flexibility of deployment. The most recently deployed analog microwave systems can transmit 61,800 two-way voice signals simultaneously. And more importantly, microwaves attenuate far less rapidly than electrical signals transmitted through copper, though they are susceptible to degradation by rain and fog. Still, at the frequencies used for phone transmissions, microwaves can reliably transmit 25 to 30 miles. In the PSTN, a microwave trunk consists of a chain of tall towers like this one, which serve as relay stations at 25 to 30 mile intervals. Microwave transmission requires direct line of sight from transmitter to receiver, which is why the towers are always tall and usually located on high ground. At the top of each tower, directional antennas are arranged in pairs to facilitate two-way transmissions and for each pair, there's usually another pair pointing in the opposite direction. Incoming microwave signals are received, amplified, and then retransmitted onward to the next tower, like this. Now today, microwave trunks in the PSTN have mostly been replaced by fiber optic cable. Yet, microwave remains quite valuable for situations where stringing cable can be problematic for crossing deserts or mountainous regions, and for connections to remote locations like islands. The microwave band is also used for satellite communications, an application for which cables of any kind aren't particularly helpful. And today, this technology is finding all sorts of new applications in private commercial point-to-point -point communications over relatively short distances, as illustrated by this directional antenna on this hospital roof. In the latter half of the 20th century, the PSTN was gradually converted from entirely analog to mostly digital. There were two principal drivers for this transition. First, analog signals are far more susceptible to loss of fidelity than digital signals. Any signal is degraded as it's transmitted, in part because it attenuates or gradually loses power, but also because it's corrupted by noise which might result from moisture in a cable, dirt on an electrical contact, or any number of other causes. In analog communications, attenuation is mitigated by periodic amplification, as we've seen. The problem is that an amplifier can only increase the power of the signal. It can't remove the noise. Indeed, an amplifier actually amplifies the noise right along with a signal, and even adds some internal noise of its own. Thus, noise accumulates throughout the transmission, and because there's no way for the receiver to distinguish between signal and noise, errors are introduced into the transmitted information. Digital signals also lose power and accumulate noise during transmission, but because a digital signal consists entirely of discrete on-off pulses, representing ones and zeros, it's much easier to distinguish between the signal and the noise. This is accomplished by a device called a regenerative repeater, which is used in lieu of an amplifier in digital systems. The repeater examines the signal, determines whether each bit was supposed to be a one or a zero, and then it regenerates a new noise-free signal and sends it on to the next repeater. Because the signal is regenerated at each repeater, noise doesn't accumulate. Thus, the very nature of digital data allows for long distance transmission with substantially fewer errors. The second major reason for the analog to digital conversion of the PSTN is that digital communications are well suited to a fundamentally different and more powerful type of multiplexing called time division multiplexing. 
To illustrate how this system works, let's assume that four phone conversations, which we'll label A, B, C, and D, will be multiplexed together. Recall that when we digitized my voice a few minutes ago, we sampled the analog waveform 8,000 times per second and generated an 8-bit chunk of data for each sample. In time division multiplexing, each chunk of data from all four conversations is fed sequentially into a single transmission, like this, with each conversation having its own assigned time slot. This simple example has four channels. But the U.S. baseline standard for time division multiplexing uses 24 channels per circuit. And inter-exchange trunks often use 4,000 or more. So let's pause for a moment and reflect on what this really means. When I make a long-distance phone call, my conversation is being broken up into tiny pieces at 1 8,000th of a second intervals interwoven with similar pieces of at least 23 other people's conversations sent through a wire as a series of on-off pulses representing ones and zeros, and then at the other end, miraculously reassembled into a reasonable reproduction of my voice and then sent as an analog signal over the local loop to my recipient. It is really quite a remarkable process. But in the modern world of telecommunications, nothing is more remarkable than optical fiber. First deployed in 1979, fiber optic communication involves the transmission of a digitally encoded light beam through a tiny fiber of glass. The digital encoding is accomplished by a computer-controlled laser, which sends pulses of light through an optical fiber to represent ones and zeros. The actual fiber optic cable looks like this, an inner core of ultra-pure glass, less than one two-thousandth of an inch in diameter, surrounded by a glass cladding with slightly different optical properties. The cladding then serves as a light pipe, containing transmitted light within the core by reflecting it off the boundary between the two layers, as you can see here. Outside the cladding are a plastic coating, which prevents the fiber from bending excessively, a layer of Kevlar for strength, and an outer protective jacket. Thanks to these protective layers, optical fiber can be suspended from utility poles, buried, and even used underwater. And by the way, whenever you see these gadgets on an overhead line, you can be sure you're looking at a fiber optic cable. Called thimbles, they're used to store excess cable so that if a transmission line ever breaks, there's enough extra length available to fix it with a single splice. And here's another clear indicator that you're looking at a fiber optic line. Elaborate rigging to ensure that the cable doesn't turn any sharp corners that might damage the glass fibers. The performance of optical fiber as a transmission medium is simply mind-boggling. Not only is its rate of attenuation so low that repeaters are typically needed only every 500 miles, not only is optical fiber immune to electromagnetic interference, but each of these tiny strands of glass, only slightly larger in diameter than a human hair, can comfortably carry 40 gigabits per second. That's 40 with nine zeros after it, the equivalent of over 600,000 simultaneous digitally multiplexed phone conversations. And with new advanced multiplexing methods currently being fielded, that number grows to about 3 million conversations. Imagine the entire population of Chicago placing phone calls simultaneously through one single fiber. It's no wonder that copper, coax cable, and microwave have been rendered largely obsolete by this technology. Today, optical fiber has sparked a communications revolution while fundamentally changing the PSTN. No doubt, the public switched telephone network of today it's a very different animal from the PSTN of 1950. Back then, simple analog signals were transmitted over twisted copper wires and routed through manually operated switches. Today, the, the system is digital throughout its core, entirely automated and vastly more diverse in terms of both transmission media and the kinds of information transmitted through those media. Today's PSTN is also thoroughly integrated with the internet. To a large extent, both systems run on the same public infrastructure. 
and many of us access the internet through our telephone subscriber lines. Yet the thing I find most fascinating about the PSTN of today is that despite these revolutionary developments, so many of the technologies that were part of the system when I was a kid, microwave, coax, the landline telephone, are still viable parts of the system today. The PSTN is an impressive technological achievement from many perspectives, but perhaps the most important of all is the fact that it integrates so many fundamentally different modes of communication and such a broad range of technological sophistication, yet it still operates with such a high level of reliability. In our next lecture, we'll look at a particularly important mode of communication that is integrated within the PSTN, the cell phone.